Each 406 megahertz unit is assigned a unique identity code that allows authorities to determine who is in trouble. When an EPIRB signal is detected, authorities immediately attempt to contact the registered owner of the EPIRB to verify that an emergency has occurred. This feature helps eliminate a serious false alarm problem that plagued the older EPIRB system. It also helps rescue authorities gain vital information about who and what they are looking for. For example, how many people are aboard? What type of life-saving equipment does the vessel carry? The technological superiority of the 406 megahertz system translates into faster emergency response, which is crucial for rescuing survivors, especially in cold or harsh conditions. A 406 megahertz unit sends a signal that can be relayed by the satellite immediately or held in memory until a ground station is in sight. This store and forward capability dramatically improves rescue response time. The 406 megahertz signal benefits from a clear channel that is dedicated to the EPIRB system. 406 megahertz units emit a low power transmission at 121.5 megahertz that serves as a homing signal. At the very least, test your suit on deck. If you can do so safely, test it in the water to make sure it keeps you dry. If your suit is defective or doesn't fit well enough to keep water out, don't go to sea until it's been repaired or replaced. Ideally, the immersion suits for your vessel should be stowed in a watertight compartment accessible from the deck or in an accessible portion of the wheelhouse. If that's impossible on your boat because of lack of space, stowing suits in each crewman's bunk is an acceptable compromise if they are readily available. The objective is to have the suits positioned so that the crew of a rapidly sinking boat can get them out of stowage and on their bodies as fast as possible. Immersion suits are designed so you can put them on in 60 seconds or less, but knowing how to get into your suit within a minute may not do you any good if it takes several minutes to get at it. What you have to avoid at all costs is stowing the suit so deep inside the vessel or in such an inaccessible location that you can't get at them at a moment's notice and reach an open deck. Select good equipment that meets both legal requirements and your special needs. Make sure that you and your crew know how to use it. Install the raft carefully so it can be launched either manually or in a float-free manner. Keep the painter securely fastened whenever the vessel is at sea. Launch the raft before the emergency reaches the crisis stage. Throw everything that floats overboard before you abandon ship. Grab extra emergency supplies. Wait for full inflation and board from the lowest possible point above the water. Try to board the raft directly without getting wet. Help your crewmates. Don't cut the painter if you don't have to. Be sure the drogue is working to keep you as close as possible to your last reported position. Inflate the floor, take seasickness pills, post lookouts, and establish a chain of command. Keep your morale high. This Type 1 PFD is designed to turn you from a face-down to a face-up position in the water, even if you're unconscious and in heavy seas. Short of an immersion suit, a Type 1 PFD would be the best garment to have on if you did find yourself in the water, at least in terms of flotation. It would keep your head out of the water and enable you to assume the heat escape lessening posture or help position to minimize heat loss. Because of its high level of inherent buoyancy and ability to turn the wearer face up, the Type 1 is required aboard many vessels. In mild conditions, these devices serve as effective abandoned ship garments, although they offer virtually no thermal protection. If your boat is typical, however, the Type 1 PFDs only make it out of stowage to greet the boarding officer when you're subject to a Coast Guard safety inspection. They're simply too bulky and uncomfortable to be worn routinely. There are numerous other flotation devices available on the market, some Coast Guard approved and some unapproved. There are vests, jackets, coveralls, and even inflatable suspenders or belt packs that are much less cumbersome than Type 1 PFDs.
In an emergency at sea, rescue depends upon your ability to alert someone who can help you. Floating in an immersion suit or personal flotation device, you present just two square feet of surface area to a searching aircraft or vessel. Unless you can provide a signal, your chances of being found in an area that may span thousands of miles are extremely low. In darkness or bad weather, the chances may be virtually non-existent. Fortunately, modern technology provides a broad array of effective signaling devices that make the odds of rescue today far greater than ever before. There are even some age-old signaling techniques that work as well as high technology if you understand what it is that attracts the eye of a searching pilot. A signal is anything that makes you bigger, brighter, or different than your surroundings. Keep the bigger, brighter, or different philosophy in mind and surprisingly simple items become effective signals. One of the most vital pieces of equipment in any marine emergency is your radio. We're going to take a look at the right way to use your radio in a crisis and learn what kinds of assistance this equipment can provide if you use it correctly. Modern VHF and single sideband radio equipment represent key elements of a global search and rescue system that coordinates military and civilian vessels, aircraft, and satellites to provide worldwide response capability. Designated distress, safety, and calling channels within the VHF and single sideband radio frequency spectra create a monitored distress and safety system that makes it much safer to live or work at sea today than ever before. As long as you're equipped with the right radio gear, the search and rescue system allows you to summon help in seconds from virtually any spot on the globe. What kind of radio equipment do you need? A fire at sea can be terrifying. There is no place to run and no fire department to call. At least initially, the crew of a burning vessel has only itself to depend on. As with all marine emergencies, the threat of fire can be minimized by a pair of related procedures, prevention and preparation. Prevention is the best form of fire protection, but even the most thorough prevention program won't entirely eliminate the potential for fire aboard your vessel. Because the threat of fire persists 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, it is essential to prepare both the vessel and the crew as thoroughly as possible. The subject of this program is crew preparation and the critical event we call first response. The first response to a fire may represent the difference between a catastrophe and a crisis averted. In coping with fire, time can be your principal ally or your worst enemy. Fire has the ability to increase in intensity up to five times in the first minute up to 25 times in the second minute, and up to 125 times in the third minute. The alternatives to preparation and practice are chaos and panic. Imagine a football team trying to compete without plays or assigned positions. It's up to the master of each vessel to devise detailed contingency plans for the major emergencies the vessel could confront. Then, the plans have to be tested. When you hold a drill, you'll probably be surprised at how many things you've overlooked and at how much you learn. An undrilled crew probably won't function well in a real emergency. On the other hand, trained crews that survive a crisis often state, it was just like a drill. The quality of the information you gain will be directly proportional to how seriously you and your officers treat the exercise. The crew won't be fooled. If the drill isn't important to you, it won't be important to them. The more hands-on the drill, the more information the crew will retain. 